You need to go into the project properties, go on to the debug uh, pro uh, settings, and there's this snappily named do not launch but debug my code when it starts option. You just check that. And then you actually F5 your the foreground, you know, your project that has got the background task in it. And it will deploy it and it will kind of Visual Studio will kind of look like it's going into a debug session, but then actually nothing then happens. So you don't need a second instance of Visual Studio. You can use the same instance, just go into the properties of the and make sure that you have multiple startup um, applications. You could do that, yeah. Or, or just simply launch the foreground app just by you know, just start it from the start menu or something, right. you, you know, apps. But, or you can set up another instance of Visual Studio and debug the, launch, the st client app at the same time. But essentially, this is where you get an instance of Visual Studio that uh, when, it, when your it's, background it's service... Always listening, it's always listening, basically. Yeah, so when the app service, the background task gets activated, then, and you'll have set a breakpoint, of course, in, it, in, your, in your run method or in your on request receive, probably. It will fire, and uh, you'll get uh, halted. You'll get a break at the breakpoint, and you feels can like magic almost. Debug. It, it's awesomely amazing. Yeah. yeah. So there you go. That's that's kind of the tip on how you do that. Uh, maybe this would be easier if we took a look. Let's see. Yeah, let's do this and uh, show a, show a nice example of how this works. Here we are in the app service, which just has a foreground code. It's foreground app just has code to show us the package family name. That's all. It uh, doesn't have a UI, but all the clever stuff is in the app service itself, the background task. But what it must have is in the package app manifest, it needs to declare that app service. It needs to have the entry point in the background task and an app service name like that. Then we go down here is the background task. And inside that, we've got a run method like normal, where we first of all get a, the service deferral from the args in case we want to terminate ourselves later on. And then we look at how we've been triggered, which is at this app service trigger. Check that the name correct is correct. And then we hook up a request received event handler so that we can handle any incoming requests. This is the request received where we process all the calls to our app service. It just gets past a value set, uh, which we are using a simple command string. So here's the calc sum option where we can extract a couple of values from our value set. Uh, do our processing, which is just add them together, build another value set to return, and then call send response async. Uh, the message deferral is case building async. Uh, this is where we use that service deferral to quit ourselves if we so wish. Don't have to do that. Okay, let's run the app service app, and so we can just get that package family name. So that is the startup, so we're deploying it and running it. Uh, here we go, there's the package family name, we've written to the a message dialog and also to the debug, so we can copy it from there. Now let's go off and uh, get our uh, look in our client where the code is to call the service. First of all, we're configuring an app service connection object with the package family name. So we can paste in that value that we just uh, copied from the service. And we also set the correct app service name, and then we call app service connection .open async. Once we've got our connection, then we can start sending data to that service. So we build a value set, put our values into it, call send message async, and wait for the response. And when we get our response, we put it up on the screen. All right, let's run that. Here we are, put our two values into the input text box, call our service, and the response has come back from the app service. Uh, the app service is still running, so we can call it multiple times. Let's just call it again, put a new value in there, call it again, and we get the answer back again. So that's good. How do we debug our app service, though? Well, you need to go into the uh, app that's hosting the service, go into the debug properties, set that do not launch, but debug my code when it starts. Set this as the startup project. And then we need to go in and set a breakpoint in our app service. So here we go, set a breakpoint up here. And then we can uh, run it in the debugger. It'll start, the debugger will start, but nothing will actually show. And then you need to run your client app, either directly like this or through another copy of Visual Studio. Uh, make the call to the service, and now we've hit the breakpoint in the background task. And now you can do all the normal debugging stuff you do, step through, inspect values. Uh, and as you see here, we're stepping through the code and sending the response back to the client. So there you go. That's a very simple example of an app service. Let's take a look at a more interesting example. This is a synonym service. So again, same thing with the app that's hosting the service. We've just got some stuff to get the package family name in the foreground app. 
But of course, in the manifest, uh, we've declared the app service. And this one is the synonyms app service. Uh, it's the uh, background task is uh, synonym service task, which is up here. This is the background task. Um, you'll notice there's a Bing key. I'll come back to that in a moment. In the run method, then we, we get uh, triggered. And in the app service connection request received, we receive our a value set and I'm calling the synonym API to actually do the processing. So this is a real kind of doing some real processing here. Synonym API has a method get synonyms async and what it does is it passes a password credential which contains a, of a API key uh, and we are requesting using HTTP client JSON to this URI which is a uh, Azure uh, marketplace uh, service, a cloud service from Azure. And we call get string async to get something from that service. And we're using uh, JSON.NET in order to deserialize the response into something that we can then extract the synonyms from. So how did I get this? This is the Microsoft Azure Marketplace, the Synonyms API, which is on trial right now. And uh, you, can, you can use this and try it. There's a developer guide. This is how I figured out how to make a call to it um, using raw HTTP calls. So you can go in and uh, you can sign up for this service and use it for free on trial. And this is how I figured out how to call it. So we get the um, response back from it. Now, in our client app, then we have the logic to make the call to our service. So here, same stuff, app service connection, set the right name, put the right package family name on it for our app service. Then we open a connection and then we start sending it data to the service. So there's our value set with a command. Uh, which is get synonym and then we are looking at the results so I run that let's check it out and I'm going to put in here ctac get synonyms for ctac so let's make it a call up to Azure so the cloud service and it's come back with the results ctac Seattle Tacoma Seattle Tacoma Airport is the the different synonyms for that pretty nice demo there Andy so I think it makes a lot of sense it's a quite a tool in our toolbox so to speak oh yeah I mean there's a lot of excitement chatting to people in Microsoft and seeing how these kind of app services are going to be able to be created and really build more and more of these to expand the capabilities that are available to, to first party apps and, and also to third party apps. Now with great power comes great responsibility. Right. We know there are things around app services we need to consider before you just dive in. Yeah. You know, walk us through the, the thought process. Yeah, so let's let's dig a bit deeper into some of these things you want to think about. What about okay, the, the lifetime of this thing? Ah. You know, I've already said obviously it's activated on demand and we've seen the process where your background task gets activated by this special app service trigger. Um, how long will it is it live and how long can it stay there? So well, first of all, the client may cause its app service connection its app service to die just by if it disposes of the app service connection it got when it made the initial connection. Okay. That will cause the service to die. Um, or, as we saw you know, earlier in this session, a little, you could actually build into the protocol. You could say, you know, a quit command or, you know, you're done or whatever. Yeah. So that's up to you if you want to implement that in your protocol that, that you devise for your app service. And the other thing is if the client app, the invoking app, is suspended while, while this communication was going on and while the app ah. service thing um, the app services sponsored by the app will be will be terminated um, so it, you know obviously you've got to have some logic in your invoking app the client app uh, that um, if it gets activated again presumably the next time it tries to access the app service uh, it will get a, 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 a it, will like, it will have to launch it again so you need to make sure that you, you test for that scenario so I saw where we when we first ran it we checked to see if there was success that's important because yep. there's more than just success we could get back. Yep, that's right. So you might get uh, resources not available if the, the, you know, the device is running short of resources. Uh, you might get resource limits exceeded later on. Uh, yeah, so, um, or if your logic assumes that, well, on activation, assumes that the app service was still there, that might not be the case. So you might have to, you know, simple, simply enough, you just have to re-invoke it and make, get a new app service connection instance and, and uh, pick up where you left off. App services think web services for your apps, but only on the device. Yep. So there's a lot of other similarities to web services as well here. We have a yeah. protocol. Yeah, these are very much modeled on web restful web services. This is what, we, what uh, we were thinking of when we built this. So uh, it's designed to be flexible and lightweight. And we've designed it to be, we're not going to kind of really uh, uh, 
demand a particular protocol. We just give them this nice, lightweight, message-based uh, mechanism, uh -huh. and then you know it's kind of up to you how what you build on top of this. Very simple request response message API. We've got these key load of this, this payload of these value sets, which are 100 kilobytes maximum. Uh -huh. um, you know, if you need to send more data than that, you could actually use um, get the shared storage manager and get a file token and send that over. You know, oh, so all, all that good kind point. of good stuff. So there's lots of ways of, of handling that one, but it's easy to use with uh, multiple different payloads. So the what what you build to order actually for a client to talk to your service is pretty much up to you. So you just have to think in terms of the protocol you're defining effectively a an endpoint. And just like any RESTful web service, you'll say you, you have to publish in some way on, on a web page or some, some web portal or something. Uh, the, the protocol that a client needs to go through in order to successfully communicate with your app service. So you just kind of document it. And like we talked about before, I have the ability to pass a payload to that background task. It has the ability to pass it, pass something back to me, sure, or not. It or could not. just yep. execute something on, on behalf. Yep. I might actually want something back, maybe a receipt or something like that. Yeah, but it does. I don't have to wait for it to finish. That's scenario specific. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's whatever the the function of that service is and how you've defined it. Makes sense to me. Sure. Yeah. So if you want a kind of one one sentence little summary of. Uh, of what they are. So we started with one. I'm going to give you another one. App Services provides a way for applications to communicate with each other. I mean, it's it's a and mechanism. most specifically without invoking a UI. Without invoking a UI, which is why it's so valuable and so powerful. Yeah, uh, yeah, and it's uh, very extensible. Okay, right. Now you've seen there uh, the examples we've seen so far. The, it's we've got this lightweight message-based protocol for for a client to talk to a service, and that's fine. Yeah, um, but you know, there's kind of a, that's kind of verbose, if you like, in okay. terms of it. Yeah. So, wouldn't it be nice? It wouldn't be nice if we just had a nice, clean, uh, high-level, strongly typed API to talk to our app service oh instead my. of all of this open an app service connection, send this message. Oh, like a proxy, a, an encapsulated yeah. wrapper. Uh, just a nice, clean wrapper. Yeah. And yeah. this is very much what we see people doing. So. Um, if you've got a, hopefully you've created the world's most popular app service, you will clearly want to provide an API to developers to make it even easier for them to use ah. your app service. So you, you just define a, another a wrapper, a facade around your service and hide all that um, communications detail inside a client library, which you can then ship maybe, probably a great way of doing that would be to uh, build it as a uh, as a package and ship it through NuGet. So we're not talking about a feature of Windows 10. We're talking about a best practice if you create a background application, yep. a background task that does some sort of servicing for yep. another app. You could write the wrapper and deploy it out through NuGet so it's easy for them to consume it without having to know all these yeah, intimate right. details yeah. of your application. Well, you, you see this over and over. I mean, like with Azure or something like that. You know, you can you can be down in the weeds and doing raw protocol messages to talk to some service, or you can download from NuGet the such and such a, an SDK. Ah. And you, you get the high level methods. Just the same same kind just of idea. Just makes sense. Yeah. I was just thinking. So I have my my uh, background task, and I'm waiting there to process something. Um, what if somebody I don't want to process for starts calling me? Is there any way for me to limit the callers? Yeah, okay, so yeah, can I restrict access? Well, well that's up to you, really. Uh, you know. So again, we got this very lightweight thing. It's the same, the same idea as with RESTful web services. So there's going to be different techniques that you can use for validating it, particularly enterprises, of course, are going to be interested in this. So uh, you can build your own caller validation mechanism on top of app services. One thing that you do get is... Which would be like in the value set, I could pass a, some sort of key or token? You could exactly do that, yes. That's right. It could be a hash, t it could be an X5, it could be a, an actual use X5 and 9 certificates, for example. You know, oh, yeah, you, you could, could go that. to town. Um, I mean, one thing we do get for free, if you like, is the package family name of the caller is automatically passed in the args to, on, every, on every message to uh, the service anyway. So you can't so, anonymously call No, it. you can't. So, the simplest kind of mechanism would be, particularly for an enterprise, just to whitelist all the callers and yeah. just say, oh, is this in my list? Oh, yeah, I know about you. you that know, probably you know. makes the most sense. Yeah, nice and simple. If you can't, if it's not, that's if it's an enterprise application. Sure. If it's a generic application where you're just providing a service to anybody who wants to call, creating a whitelist could be actually very difficult because yeah, that's not going to not going to be that. practical. No, that's right. Um, so they they might have to build other other mechanisms on sure. that. With, yeah, but there's you know there's plenty of ways of. 
It's, it's what, interesting. What about if I call out to a service? I, I could call to that task, and the task is actually thinking of all the logic that we used in April, right? We've actually upgraded that. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you have to think about um, uh, versioning. So, and this, again, is something with REST services. You have to think of what you are doing is defining a, a known protocol mm -hmm. for talking to your app service. If you break that, or you, you, know, you add new features and enhance it and, and expand it, sure, then you are defining a new endpoint for your, your clients, and you need to support the older one for at least a period, of like until you, maybe until you withdraw it. So uh, just the same as, as any, if you're creating any kind of programming library, an API, any service. a contract, talking about the UAP thing, yeah, any service, you, you have a, you know, you're, you're you need to guarantee to your users that you're going to continue to support them. Uh, and, and, but it doesn't matter what you come up with, no. because we already talked about it, you're going to wrap it anyway. The user yeah. doesn't know, need to know all the trickiness that you put into it, or the, I don't mean the user, but the developer doesn't need to know. No, that's right. Because all you're going to do is return a not available or version not available, something like that's that. That's right, yeah. Or, you know, or so it could give warning. Anyway, yeah, there's plenty of ways of doing that. Right. And if you are shipping a, 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 a client SDK through NuGet or something, yeah, you just put a new a V1 and a V2 and a V3 kind of API in there to allow uh, client developers to take advantage of new features.